everybody. We're going to get started in a minute. I just want to thank you guys all for coming. I'm Liz. I'm the uh, director of Bay Path Humane Society. And thank you guys for coming out for this. We starting last <laughs> That's not how it works. <laughs> we started last year with a little lecture series that we do a couple in the fall and spring. And just trying to think of um, different things that appeal to pet owners, medical and behavior stuff. And so thank you for taking part. And then someday when we get our act together, we'll maybe poll everyone to see what other kind of topics you're, you're interested in. But um, thank you for coming today. These ladies are incredible. They are located out of Marlboro, right? Mm -hmm. yep. And um, Nance and Dana, and they have helped um, Bay Path in many ways, including literally fostering dogs, but welcoming our dogs into their um, training facility. And uh, we've had other places that didn't frankly want uh, our shelter dogs um, there and they welcome them because they come in and they're, they're a handful sometimes and they just need a little bit of uh, structure and they allow mm -hmm. us to drop into their classes and they've come to our shelter to help our animals. So beyond being excellent trainers, they're just great people. Thank you. And so we yes. just thank you guys for coming so much. Well, thank, you. thank you. Well, that's just like you guys. You guys are great people too because you're helping Bay Path, you know, in so many different ways. and. Really, it's a you know if there was no community to surround Bay Path, they really wouldn't um, you know they wouldn't have a chance to help all of these animals. And from our experience, the animals that have come into the facility and come into our homes, uh, it's been amazing the transition that they've made. And you know a lot of that is due to um, you know maybe some of you know Lizzie Paul. You know she's come to classes with particular dogs and worked um, you know with fosters and bring them in and they found homes and successfully you know have transitioned into those homes because of working with those dogs in those classes so okay so what you're interested in today you're wor interested in working on um, some of these common common behavior issues that you're having you know as far as training and getting your dog to listen and jumping and pulling on the leash and just not listening not coming when called fluffy come 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 right over and over and it's frustrating so we're gonna help you with that today we're gonna give you the tools that you need and you know we're here for you too so if you ever wanted to come to classes or work privately or maybe you know work to bring a foster dog in for classes something like that get some more experience we're we're open to that okay so I'm Nance Moran this is Dana Langley um, my background is I have a master's degree in biology, but I started in veterinary technology. So I had this, you know, distinct love for animals ever since I was little. You know, I wanted to I wanted to be a veterinarian. I wanted to work with dogs. Um, so you know, my life has just gone along that path. But I transitioned from veterinary technology to a master's degree in biology and worked in the field of orthopedic research for over 15 years. So, okay. So first step, right? I have the medical veterinary background. Second step is, okay, now I have a scientific-based background and then my passion, right? So all these things give me a really nice three-dimensional approach to training, you know, so I'm not just seeing just one aspect of behavior. I'm seeing all different things such as medical issues that might be causing these behavior uh, changes, um, you know, uh, genetics part of science as well, but it's also scientific-based training. So it's a proven model of training. So those that refute that positive reward-based training doesn't work, I can tell you that, you know, there's just so much evidence out there and we can just prove it to you. So come in, you know, I don't want, I don't want to argue with the trainers that do like to use positive punishment-based methods, but what I say is come into our facility and just try it. Learn for yourself, see whether or not you like it. So that's the best argument that, that you can give for that kind of thing. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so Life is Dog is at 461 South Street. That's the corner of uh, Maple and South Street. And um, we work on training and behavior modification, uh, basic manners, um, some of the issues that you're having, trouble behaviors at home or in public with other dogs, reactive dog. I'm sure you've all heard of this. This is, you know, when a dog is lunging, pulling, barking, you know, when they see another dog, person, object, car, wind, <laughs> anything like that. Um, and it's one of my favorites because I have a close history with it because I had a dog that was reactive. So, and it, the, as, the results are just so remarkable. Dana and I can tell you that every dog that we have ever worked with has successfully gotten to the point where the owner could walk them comfortably and have the tools in hand to be able to deal with any situation and get the dog's attention. 
we do day camp for puppies and adult dogs. <clears throat> We're extremely careful because it's a smaller day camp environment. It's not like your um, you know, larger daycares that are out there where they've got 50 dogs and one person watching them. We have you know, small groups, a lot of one-on-one -on -one attention with these dogs. Um, and we watch their behavior because, I mean, really what people need to face is that, you know, maybe, maybe four in every 20 dogs is actually the right candidate for day camp and would actually enjoy it. Otherwise, it can be very stressful. So we have to monitor their behavior and make sure that they're really enjoying it um, because we don't want to cause any harm. You know, we have a no harm policy where it's just, you know, yeah, yeah mon money is fantastic to be taking in for the business, but you don't want to be doing any damage at the same time. And then we also do dog walking, Framingham and Central North Framingham, Southboro, Marlboro, and parts of Sudbury as well. Okay, so the top five training pet fees, at, at least on my list, are, and what I've heard from people, are pulling on the leash, jumping, poor greetings, you know, somebody's walking into your home, grandma's coming into your home, and Fido has really sharp claws, and she's got her nylons on that day, and he keeps <laughs> jumping on her, and her skin is really, you know, very sensitive and can tear as easily, so we need to work on that. Poor impulse controls. Does anybody know what I mean by that? Anyone? <laughs> Do you want to tell me? Uh, no, I'll just continue. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sounds like there's a funny story about that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. So it's sort of it's having pa teaching them to have patience and ask for things in a polite way, uh, versus you know throwing a tantrum, you know barking, jumping. Uh, pawing at you, trying to get your attention, trying to get some type of resource from you. Um, and the best way for them to do it is to, you know, seek you out and work on every aspect of it and get it the quickest that they can. Not paying attention. Yeah, so we've all been there, right? You know, it's over there sniffing the floor and Bailey, come here, Bailey, come here, Bailey, 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 right? And they're just not paying attention to you. So we're going to teach you about that. And coming when called, you know, everybody wants that dog that is 100 proof to come to you in any different scenario. So we're going to teach you the steps for doing that as well. Okay, a little bit of background, marker reward training. Um, it's the most successful way to build your relationship with your dog. And then training is also easy and fun. It shouldn't, it shouldn't feel like work. It, you should come out of there glowing and feeling like you did an amazing job. Um, that's not to say you know, the dog that you brought that day or that dog that you're working with that day is the dog that you're working with. Okay? He's different from the day before. He's different from 10 minutes before. So recognize that. You have to adjust. It's, we train you. You train your dog. But it's really about training you to communicate effectively with your dog. Clearly, we're all here because we love dogs. We love being with them. So why not work with them as a team? You know, we don't have to uh, be a dictator or, you know, alpha. Okay. Use management and prevention and collaboration, right? Okay, first of all, let's, let's get the Band-Aid and let's put it on the wound, let's stop the bleeding, and then let's work on, you know, why did you get that cut? Let's try to work that out. Okay. Okay, number one, why do behaviors repeat themselves? Anyone have an idea why they repeat themselves? Because they work. <laughs> yeah, they get rewarded in some way. That's how they're learned. So, but it is a combination of genetics, socialization. So it's how, you know, their everyday environment, how, you know, what kind of interactions they've had. They learn from those different things and life experience as well. Okay. So if, you know, uh, a big white fluffy dog came up and, you know, as they were a little puppy and they were, you know, 19 weeks old and still in a fear stage and that, you know, white fluffy dog attacked that little puppy, that little puppy is likely going to be afraid of either larger dogs, potentially even, you know, uh, lighter colored dogs, etc. that kind of thing. Or maybe even other dogs in general. It could generalize it to that. If a dog displays a behavior and that behavior is followed by some type of resource that he likes, that behavior is going to reoccur. So that's how behaviors are rewarded and that's why they reoccur. If your dog is doing something that you don't like, um, he's somehow been rewarded for it. So, for example, jumping. Even the get off, stop it, fluff, get down. This is all rewarding because it's interaction. Okay? <coughs> Even no yelling, looking, talking, touching. It's all rewarding in some way. Okay? Pulling. 
gets me faster to that tree. Why wouldn't I pull to get there? Of course I'm gonna pull to get to that resource or there's food on the floor or something really disgusting that I need to get to. I'm gonna pull to get there. It's really rewarding. Okay. Demanding, pawing, nudging gets me your attention. So why wouldn't I do it? Mommy, 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 you know, little kids do that. Mommy, 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 pick me up, pick me up. Okay, honey. So that child just learned. If I consistently just demand to get picked up, I'm gonna get picked up. And then, you know, before you know it, you've got a big issue because you've got a heavy little child that keeps on wanting to get picked up. <laughs> okay, he's not out to get you, he or she. <laughs> Dogs live in the moment. Um, so, you know, I like to say carpe diem, right? Seize the day. Dogs are more like carpe uh, minutum, which is seize the minute. <laughs> we can probably take it down to seize the second, which would probably be better, but I don't know the Latin term for that. Um, so, you know, they just want to, if it's good for them, then they're going to get it. This is what it's about. It's, you know, if it's something that's negative, they're going to try to avoid it as best that they can. Okay. Okay, behavior relationships. So maybe you've all heard of this, the ABCs the antecedent, the behavior, and the consequence. So this is how a behavior is built upon. So the antecedent is what happens directly before the behavior happens, all right? Then the behavior occurs. So let's say, um, let's say, okay, so let me just make up a behavior. So first I walk in the door, all right? So that's what happens beforehand. Then Fluffy runs over to me and jumps up. That's the behavior, okay? What's the consequence? Well, if I'm a good trainer, I'm gonna turn around and <laughs> leave the room and remove my attention. Um, so that could be the consequence. Alternatively, I'm reaching, pushing, no, off, down, stop, stay, rewarding behavior, okay? So that's the consequence. And you know, if it gets rewarded, it's gonna reoccur. Two different learning theories that we use um, in um, reward marker training. So there's classical conditioning, which you've probably heard of Pavlov's dog, right? He did the experiment. So he associated, he rang the bell and he fed the dog. He rang the bell, he fed the dog. Before you knew it, he would ring the bell and the dog would drool. So this is, um, you know, the, the bell became the predictor for the food without even showing the food. So as a consequence of that, it had a conditioned uh, involuntary response or a conditioned emotional response. I'm getting happy, here comes food, I'm gonna to start to salivate. Um, and then there's um, operant conditioning, which is uh, B.F. Skinner was the origer, originer, uh, originator of that. And so an example of that would be like, you know, the chicken pecks at the lever, presses the lever down, and then food comes out. So this is more of a voluntary response. Um, so for instance, we might ask a dog to sit. That's a voluntary behavior. So that's more on the lines of operant conditioning. Okay, so we're gonna, but uh, Mark Reward uses both of these because we wanna counter condition and change emotional responses many times, but we also want to work with voluntary behaviors, asking the subject to do voluntary things and being rewarded b based upon those. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, any questions so far? Yeah, you do have to, Feel free, interrupt me, because otherwise I could just keep going. All right, Woo how to use a marker, clicker, or verbal. I know all of you are just like itching to press that clicker today, so. Surprise, nobody's pressed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> okay, okay, first thing that you do with a, with, a, with a dog, so even if you didn't have a clicker, you could use a verbal marker. You wanna keep that marker the same. Like I use, I don't always carry a clicker around, right, it's just not convenient. I use yes. But when I'm originally teaching a behavior to a dog, I use a clicker because it's very effective in teaching that. It doesn't sound different. My voice doesn't sound different. Um, you know, the clicker doesn't sound different. My hands versus Dana's hands, it's very distinct. It catches the exact second of the behavior that you want. So for instance, I'm sorry, you're an obstructed view. <laughs> you are right. Um, it marks the exact second of the behavior. For, so if you're asking for a sit, it's the second that the bottom touches the floor, right? Click, click. If I were using just my voice and I weren't very well trained in that, I might say, oh, good dog, Fluffy, and Fluffy's already done five different things, which is, you know, down, sit, stay, roll over, you know, all these different Lick things. Nose. Yeah, <laughs> Lick their nose, right. So then the dog says, oh, I don't know what I did, let me try it all again. So it's more effective with the clicker at first. That's what we say. And then you can transition over to using a verbal marker so that you don't always have to have the clicker around. But I do really like the clicker. I think it's very fast and effective in teaching at first and you're gonna get the best, the quicker result from doing that. 
unless you're very well trained and you can stop yourself from, you know, saying, you know, additional comments after your yes. Okay, so after conditioning the clicker um, or the marker, um, so actually, sorry, let me back up a little bit. So con to condition it, you need to, it's, we also alternatively call it charging the clicker. So it's sort of, I know it doesn't have a plug and there's no electrical energy in there. But when we, um, all we do when we have a dog with us and we want to condition the clicker, we want to teach the dog that the click means that there's a reward following. Okay, the click means there's a reward following. So it's the same thing as Pavlov, the bell, right? It means there's a reward following. So all we do is we're gonna, we would place the clicker behind our back because we don't we wanna, you know, for, when we're first working with the dog, we don't know how they're gonna react to the clicker. So we go ahead and we click, we grab the treat, and we go again and give a treat. We're not asking for anything. And we're gonna do that about a dozen times. And we're gonna condition the, the clicker with the dog. So then they understand, they start to whip their head up at you as soon as they hear the click, like, where's my treat? Where's my treat? As soon as they hear that click. So they really, really get stimulated by it. Alternatively, if you're using your voice, yes, treat, yes, treat. Again, no expectation, asking for nothing. However, don't treat if they're jumping on you. <laughs> Bring it down and get their feet on the ground. Um, don't treat if they're biting you, <laughs> you know. You wanna make sure that you're not um, promoting conditions that, you know, were happening. So conditioning the clicker is the first step. Um, after conditioning, um, the click will mark the exact second of the behavior, so that's what we talked about, the sit. Um, yeah, and more feedback is better than less in the beginning. So that means click a lot, treat a lot, don't be stingy. We are stingy, stingy, stingy people. The treats only need to be tiny, like less than pea-sized. It's just enough of a, to give them, you know, a scent really in their mouth. So make it small because you can make, you know, if you used a hot dog, you can make over 100, 100 treats. So that's 100 clicks that you could use. So uh, if you use a chicken breast or something like that, you've probably got over 300 you know, pieces, so. Yeah, or ki use their, you can also alternatively, if you're not in a high distracting environment, you can use their kibble in the morning and at night. You know, when you feed them, you can go ahead and use their kibble to do training. So keep a section of that, okay? All right, supplies. I definitely recommend you either have a sweatshirt that has pockets, something like that, or get yourself a bait bag. Bait bags are great because your hands are free. Your treats are in there. Um, sometimes I see people walking around with bags and a leash and the clicker and they're trying to juggle all these things and it's just, it's not an effective way of doing it. So help yourself out, get something, even if it's, ju even if it's just your pocket, you know, uh, an apron, anything like that. Okay, tiny pea-sized treats, we just talked about that. Really high value if you're working on something that's really difficult or you're working in a distracting environment. Um, very small, don't be stingy. Um, chicken, string cheese, steak, hot dogs are all great, great, great high value things, but you need to figure out with your dog or the dog that you're working with, you know, what their scale of one to 10 is for motivation. Some of them don't even want food. Some of them would rather play with you, so maybe it's a toy. Um, a game of tug, you know, some, a playing ball, squeaking, something like that. Um, you're gonna get yourself a four to six foot leash, no retractable leashes. Uh, buckle call or martingale or harness. We like the front clips, ha clip harnesses. They're a really good uh, mechanical um, use for us where, you know, the, many of you have probably heard of the uh, opposition reflex. So if the, if the um, harness has a clip on the back, they're typically gonna pull forward. So if there's pressure pulling back, they're gonna pull forward. If the harness has a clip on the front and you're walking along, they're gonna pull backwards. So they're not gonna yank you forward with a harness in the front. Okay, there's also gentle leaders, you've probably heard of those. They're not a muzzle, they don't hurt the dog. You just have to make sure that you acclimate them appropriately to the gentle leader. And that means things like, um, you know, you can do some counter conditioning first with, you know, treating as the dog goes towards the gentle leader, etc. But you can also put it on at feeding time and then just take it off. Um, don't ever jump into a scenario where you're just gonna throw it on and think you're gonna go for a walk because you're, you're not. <laughs> you're gonna take a lot of steps backward, but they come with um, some great CDs with all of the information on how to acclimate them to that, so I think that's really great to have. Um, no, I don't have any stock in either any of these products, so I get nothing from them. Uh, no choke, pinch, or electronic or aversion techniques. We don't need to go into detail about that. Um, create success, so if you have a high energy jog, play ball. 
take them for a walk, do something to get some of that energy out so that they can focus on you. Set yourself up for you know, a successful training session. Um, feed a good diet, but don't feed right before class. So allow a couple of hours so that they're, you know, you don't want them to be starving. Certainly don't not feed them for the day. If, if you're going to play before, uh, before class, right? mm -hmm. how do you know how much can you play if the dog will be tired mm -hmm. before the class? So probably you don't want them to be exhausted. I mean, if you, if you know the dog and the dog is your own dog, you sort of know you know, what 20 minutes looks like, you know, and what type of activity. So if you're playing ball and it's really aggressive play and your dog is exhausted typically after 20 minutes, maybe, you know, pull back a little bit, do 10 minutes. It depends on the dog, yeah. on the size, on the, the age. The energy. In the breed, in the energy. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, a, a lab, you know, is just forever energy. They stop for two minutes and then they're you know, they've got their two minute cat nap and then they're back to, to time of energy. So you may have to exercise a lab for an hour before you take them to class. <coughs> but a 10 month old um, Maltese or a six month old Maltese, you may only need to, which is a smaller dog, you may only need to exercise them for 15 minutes right. before class. So it really depends on the breed, the dog and the age. And you, you know, and if you aren't sure, then come to class and ask us and we'll, we, we can mm -hmm. probably judge, you know, from just working with, with you on how much exercise. I can exercise my dogs for two hours and take them to class and they're, they're still loaded with energy. So, you know, again, it depends on the dog. Yeah. 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 So the question was, the question was, you know, how much, how much exercise should they be getting prior to coming to class? And we don't want to be to the point of exhaustion. So what Dana was saying was it really depends on the breed, the amount of energy, the age, etc. You don't want to overdo it. Um, but, you know, you have to go based upon your experience and you know, are they, are they going to be comfortable in paying attention at, or are they going to be so exhausted they won't get up off the floor? You, you, we don't want them to be at that point. But um, as Dana said, we're also, you know, come to class. We're happy to help you with figuring out what that adjustment is. Okay. Okay. Um, so, yeah, use meals. That's what Dana was just talking about. Keep sessions short and fun. So if you have had a horrible day, and you come home and like the last thing in the world is that you want to do another training session with your dog, don't do it. You're just going to negatively impact your dog and you. You're going to get nothing done and you know, you've got all these things going on. Just skip that one. Skip it. You know, you're much better off if you just take that time to you know, sit down, meditate, have a glass of wine, whatever, <laughs> coffee, something. Take care of yourself. Uh, work on attention first. It's absolutely one of the most important things in training success. So that is like the number one thing that we work on when you walk in the door is getting your dog's attention. All right, who wants to do some work? Sure. Are you gonna go over there? Yep, I am, yep, yep, mm -hmm. yep. So I couldn't bring any, we couldn't bring any dogs, <laughs> obviously. Um, so we took a whole bunch of videos. So we're gonna show you videos on all these different training techniques. But first I want to get you comfortable with the clicker, okay? So we're going to talk about mechanics. So let's, can we do this together? There's going to be a whole bunch of clicking. All right. But again, all right. So I'm going to describe it to you. So it goes, put the clicker behind your back because it's not a remote control. A lot of times people go like this to the dog. It doesn't work like that. I try to tell my husband the same thing. It doesn't work like that, honey. And it's so, not a remote for your husband or your kids. We've tried it before. Yeah. So you're going to click, then pretend you have a treat in your bay bag, grab the treat and then offer it to the dog, okay? Click, grab the treat, offer it to the dog. It's important that the click is separate from reaching for the treat and giving the treat. Yeah. The, mm -hmm. Okay, so um, this is something that I wanted to, you have a leash in your hand, you have yep. the bag of treats, you got this in the other hand, yep. and it's like, oh my God, yep. you know, and I'm trying to do everything at once, and I, I keep saying, just slow down. It's okay. She'll yeah. Wait. But sometimes by the time I get the treat, she's already yeah. out onto of the, the train thing. on to the next thing. So I don't want to treat her because she's broken what mm -hmm. she's done. So if you could just. Yep. Tell yep. So put her back in that, ask her, you know, to be back in that position again. So, okay. Yeah. And the other start from, from square one. I'm just going to demonstrate, pretend that this is a leash, right? Yep. Okay. I'm not going to use the bat, but this is the loop of the leash. You put it on your thumb, okay? You bring up any slack that you might have. Okay? Keep it loose, though. Keep, keep it, it a J. Keep it, yeah, keep it, you don't want it to be 
tight on the dog. So you have, the, have it on your thumb, bring up a little bit, and you put it in your hand, and then you take your clicker, and we, I, we have these little um, bungees. bungees that you can put on. Put the clicker on top of the leash. So now you have the leash, and you have the clicker in one hand. And this hand treats. In your right, so if your dog is on your left side, your leash is on the right. You have your clicker, you have your clicker on the leash, and you have your bait bag. So you got the leash, the dog, you ask the dog, Fido, sit, bum hits the ground, you click, you go into your bait bag, and you treat. So now you have two separate, you get your, your hands are free, essentially. The other option you can do if you're doing a training session is drop the leash on the ground and step on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that frees up, yep. that frees up one more thing. It really is okay. the practice though, the practice of the mechanics. You're going to get that, that muscle memory yep. of how you do things. And sometimes it just does take a second, like hold on a second, let me just put my leash on the right way and yep. put the clicker. Take the time, do it right before yep. you go ahead and get started. Yep. And you okay. can also put some treats in your hand. And just mm -hmm. put that load it up. Behind, load it up behind your back yep. so that you're not digging into your bait bag. You know, because then what you do is, um, you know, sometimes the dog does get impatient and they nudge you for the treat. Like, you, you made that thing click. Now give me my treat, damn it. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. So if you have a couple in your hand, you know, that way you click and then you can see the treat and you put your hand back yep. behind your back. Yep. Okay. Also, if you click, and even if it's by accident, you owe that dog a treat. Yeah. Okay? Because we, we're conditioning it that when way. We want to make sure. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yep. For sure. Any other questions? Okay. All right. So you did a great job with that. Um, don't keep your hand in the bait bag because your dog is just going to stare and be glued to that bait bag. So that's kind of why, you know, try to keep the clicker in the back and hand neutral. You can even put your hand in your belly button. You can put it behind your back if you want to. Resist the urge to keep it in the bag. All right, next exercise that we're going to do, we're going to work on timing, okay? So the first time we do this, this is going to be kind of funny. So it's always funny to everyone at first. So Dana is going to bounce the ball. When you see that ball hitting the floor, okay, you're going to click that exact second that the ball touches the floor. Yep. Okay. So let me bounce it first. So it bounces. Right. Good timing. Who have it clicked over here? Okay. So it hits the floor. You click. Okay. Everybody ready? Oh, ah. I want a treat. Where's my treat? Come on. Come on. All right. Ready? See if you get better. You can do it. Nice. Wow. All right, you already got better. <laughs> it's like Calypso, right? You already got better. That's fantastic. All right, last exercise. I'm going to show you, I want to teach you a little bit about uh, shaping. So a lot of times, you know, shaping is something, okay, but the best example that I can use from shaping is, um, you know, like dolphins going through, a, you know, do trainers training a dolphin to go through a hoop underwater. They would use a whistle, right, that the dolphin could hear or some other type of noise stimulation to get the dolphin to understand when the dolphin did something mm -hmm. correctly. But we can't just take a leash and lead the dolphin over to the hoop and pull them through. <laughs> so that's not really going to be effective. So what it looks, the shaping looks like is successive approximations. Does anybody know what that is? Okay. So it's, close. what's up? Get close to it. Yeah. Yeah. So we're building that, we're breaking that behavior down into tiny, tiny increments and building upon it to get to the ultimate goal behavior that we're searching for. So uh, if you had like a picture book, many, you know, everybody's probably made these when they were younger, you know, a flip book, you had different images of getting, you know, whatever the dog running or something like that, where you would flip through. So it breaks down the behavior. So think of it in that way. So if I were trying to teach my dog to roll over, but not lure him into doing that, I could go ahead and maybe he just flicks his head up. You know, I click and treat that. Now he's going to get a little bit more aggressive as time goes and start flicking up and then maybe the arm goes up. Then maybe they go on their side. So I'm going to successively mark and reward them as they get closer to the behavior until eventually we have built the behavior and they've rolled over. All right. And then they only get treated for that rollover, not the build up of the behavior, not those incremental things. So we're going to do a little exercise in that. So could I have a, vo a volunteer? Anyone? Don't be shy, you guys. <laughs> this is completely casual. This is the comfortable space. Okay. So you are going to step out of the room with Dana real quick. Okay. Uh, don't need my clicker. You don't need your clicker. Everybody else needs their clicker. Um, and then I need one more volunteer <laughs> to do some clicking for me. Come on. Don't be shy. Come on. <laughs> Good. This is a safe space. Yeah, come on up front. I'm going to have you come up front. We're going to wait till they leave. Cover her ears. Okay. All right. We, and we haven't met before, right? 
Pardon? We haven't met we before. Have not. Okay. <laughs> I haven't met her before either. Okay, so there was no, you know, preconceived uh, planning on this particular exercise. So, okay, so let's choose something that we want to shape. Um, we want to shape her to do when she comes in. So maybe something like turning in a circle. We could do that. Standing on one leg, jumping. Which one do you guys want to do? Standing on one leg. Standing on one leg. Okay. All right. So you're going to shape her to okay. do that. So you're not going to talk to her. You're not going to tell her how to do anything. You're not going to lure her to, into any positions. You're not going to give her any, <laughs> any looks <laughs> or anything like that. But you're going to click her for a success of a product. And what that might look like is she may, maybe just lifts her foot. Or maybe she steps up. Okay. You're going to click that. So you're going to be hinting to her. Okay. Okay. So the clicker is going to say, oh, that's closer. Oh, that's closer. Well, that's close. If she doesn't get it, well, too bad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So that's what we're going to do. Okay. When you're ready. You What's your name? I'm Beth. Beth? Okay. She's going to click. She's going to click. What's your name? Corinne. Corinne? Okay. Corinne, we're going to shape you. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what we're going to do, let me just explain to her what's going to happen. So when you hear a click, it means you're closer to the behavior that we're trying to target for you to do. Okay? okay. All right. Let me get out of the way. So you just offer things. Be a thinking dog. Yeah. Just try to get the thing to click. Yep. Can I give her hints? Like no. Nope. <laughs> do you want me to do this? <laughs> okay. So now what would let's stop right there for a second. So now what would you do? So she's offered like the same repeat behavior several times now. Turn around. No. No. Nope. Right. Not click. Wait for something else. Okay. Oops. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's different. Okay. So your timing of the click is really, really important here. Okay. okay. I guess you catch her when. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you missed. You missed. Okay. So if you look away, you miss an opportunity, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're a thinking dog. Try other things. That was a bad <laughs> Get creative. I'm focused. Yeah. I'm focused on the wrong Yeah. Everyone here is focused. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, Beth, we're going to have you stop for a second. Dana, you want to do some clicking? <laughs> sure, okay. All right. I think I think I've So what else can you, you, so like, you know, if you were a dog, you'd start to go, oh my God, you know, oh this, God. Is, this is so right. crazy, so, right? So, yeah. Right, right? So think about Try what other things. Are you doing when you do this? Right, but what else are you doing? Putting my heel on. What else are you doing? Mm -hmm. 
Moving my leg. What else are you doing with your other leg? Moving that. Am no, no. I right? Do you? Yeah. yeah. So I yeah. think I think what we're missing here is we're missing targeting the exact second she lifts that leg up. Yeah. Okay. So okay. you just want okay. to do this. Yeah. That's, yeah. Bam. 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 So that's why this is so. This is a good example, right, of why timing is so critical. And if the dog isn't getting it, you're not a dog by yeah. any means. No, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> if the dog isn't getting it, you have to back up. Back up a step. So I would be ready, and I'd be click. Click right at the very second. Okay. That was hard. Yeah, good. Welcome with it. I think that was what you wanted. I like to keep everybody surprised with what I'm doing. I just want to Sure. Could you ever lift the dog's leg up and click it to show them that's what they're looking for? So dogs learn much more effectively if they're thinking and they're doing it themselves. So yeah, a lot of you know a lot of people push the dog into a sit and that kind of thing. But they're not, you know, not learning on their own. They're more likely to repeat that behavior because they learned it themselves versus you pushing them in that position. I can guarantee you, if I catch them by accident and they sat, I can teach them faster than you can teach them with just keep on pushing their bum down. Yeah. So her question was, can you physically just lift up their, you know, lift up their paw and get them into position? and then go ahead and reward that. And my answer was that it's faster and more effective and, and better for them to learn and then they'll offer you other behaviors as well. Um, they become the thinking dog. Right, okay. and the other thing you, you could do rather than actually touch your dog is you can put your hand right next to their paw and what are they gonna do? They're gonna lift it, right? Yep. So that's, yep. you know, that's they may lift it and they may hit mm -hmm. you. You know, or, you but know. catch the first point of that. Right, but catch yep. it as it mm -hmm. comes up. Yeah. 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 So shaping is more challenging, but as you get better at it, you become more effective at it, and it yeah. can be a lot of fun to just not be giving any, you know, any any instruction other than you know yeah. using that marker right. to and say dogs, that you're closer. Dogs don't, contrary to what people believe, dogs don't understand English. Mm -hmm. We need to teach them the English okay. language. Yeah. We can say sit, 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 and they're going to look at you, and it's like you're saying strawberry to them. They have yeah. no idea what sit means. We need to <laughs> teach them the behavior first before putting an English word to that behavior. When do you do that? Once they can do the behavior successfully. If you can bet me $100 that it's a, the behavior is going to happen, then you can name it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a question? I was just going to ask, are there certain sort of behaviors or exercises that you recommend starting with? Yep. Attention, yeah. yeah. Yep, we're going to go through that. Yeah, so number one is attention, definitely, to start. And you, um, I'm not going to show you name the name game, but it's, it stems off of that as well. So that's another thing is to use their name in, you know, in a valid way versus using it randomly all the time. Okay. Yeah, or in a negative way. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's also the lost reward or lost opportunity marker. So, um, for instance, when I said, you know, if she's really doing something wrong, just turn, turn your back, turn around. Um, you can say, uh-uh, nope, too bad, that's not it, you know. But try to keep it the same. It's not a punishment. It doesn't inflict anything upon the dog. It just says, hey, you're, you're, just, you're way off. This is not what I'm looking for. This is not the behavior. And it just says, you know, you lost the possible opportunity to gain a resource from me in doing that be Can behavior. Sure. Uh, so it's our non-reward marker. So the clicker mm -hmm. yep. is the reward marker. You did something right. That uh -uh, uh, oops or oh no, you know that's the no reward marker. Right. Right. So you're teaching them when they hear that, you know, you did something I didn't quite like. And you're not getting punished for it, but you're not you're not getting the reward. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Okay. Great. Okay. Set yourself up for success. Use the motivating rewards. So figure out what that is, whether it's food or toys or play. Um, practice the clicker mechanics and the marker. Don't go too fast or rush the steps. Um, you saw with the shaping, we were, you know, she just got a little lost. She got a little frustrated there too, didn't know what she needed to do. So it was just going too fast when we had to just break that down a little bit for her. Um, if your dog isn't getting it, back it up. It's, it's, it's our fault. If the dog isn't getting it, it's our fault. We need to back it up. Uh, make training fun, always end on a good note. And always start simply and easily in a uh, distraction-free environment. Don't try to go learn a new behavior out, you know, next to Route 9. That's not going to work. You're not going to keep your dog's focus. Uh, don't work on two or three Ds. Does anybody know what the Ds are? So there's distraction, there's distance, and there's duration. So uh, distraction can be, you know, anything that's going on in the environment. 
Duration is the amount of time you ask for a different behavior. Let's say you ask for a stay and you know, this is your first time working on stay and you're, ask, you're gonna ask for a one minute stay. That's not gonna work unless your dog is dead tired and already sleeping when you <laughs> ask them to stay. It's not gonna happen. And then distance, you know, how far are you away when you're asking for that stay? Don't go all the way across the room. Start off a foot away. That's it, okay? Okay, what you asked about, what you wanted to get to, not paying attention. Okay, why does p not paying attention happen? Uh, they're having a good time, there's more interesting things to do than you right now, and uh, they're sniffing, there's better things going on in the environment. Um, what's the behavior? They're not paying attention to you when you ask for a behavior. Could be any behavior that you're asking for. Um, the, what's the C, what's the consequence? Continued fun, maybe a game of chase me because you have to go and get them. Um, <laughs> So there's rewarding things that can happen. All right, how do we solve this? We're gonna practice the positive interrupter. Anybody heard of the positive interrupter before? It's a kissy noise. <laughs> That's what we call it, okay? And it's positive versus, uh-uh, no, cut it out, stop that. Um, it sounds better, right? It's almost funny, you almost wanna laugh. Okay, so can we all just practice doing that one time? Good, <laughs> okay. You wouldn't believe how many people have a hard time making that noise yeah. sometimes. Yeah. But you're all pretty good. Okay. So what you want to do is you want to reward um, looking at you, you know, consistently. Like, you know, when you're in a training mode and they give you good attention, go ahead and click and reward that. All right. So they're going to constantly be seeking that reward and looking at you. I like to check in when I'm walking my dog and they're moving along and then suddenly she turns back and she looks at me. I'm like, yes, good job. And I'll give her a reward because I want her to check in with me. You know, pay attention to what I'm doing. It's going to help you with any of these different behaviors. It's going to help you with loose leash walking because they're going to be looking at you and checking in. Uh, don't ask repeatedly. Don't, you know, don't do that. Um, don't say, you know, come, 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 come. Because then they're like, you know, it means nothing. It means nothing. How many times do you have to say it before I have to do what you asked me to do? Is it three times? Well, she said it like six last time. So maybe I'll go for seven. See how that works. Um, if your dog isn't listening to you when you're doing um, like calm or something like that, then you need to just, you know, don't say anything. Just go and get the dog. Don't, you know. Don't go over and punish or, or do anything like that. Just means that you're going too fast. You're working at too big of a distance under too many distractions. So back it up. Okay. All right. So here's our first video. This is my dog. This is my puppy, Charlie. Um, she's an um, English cream. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to toss a treat away just about three feet. So I don't want her yanking me across the floor and learning. So she goes to get the treat. When she starts, when she finishes the treat, I'm gonna make a kissy noise. As soon as she looks at me, I click, and then I treat her next to me. I don't reach out and give her the treat. Okay, so I'm gonna do it again, I think. Toss the treat, she gets the treat, click, and then go ahead and give her the treat as she comes to me. And she just starts offering it anyway, after a bit. All right, she's constantly looking at me. Let's see a whip around. I always do do it with a leash in the beginning because I want her to be know that, okay, we're training, we're working together right, and to keep her more focused. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that was her first time doing that exercise there and she did really, really well. Okay. So that's the first thing to getting attention. So you need to reward attention. Use your positive interrupter to get that attention. The positive interrupter can be used in all sorts of different scenarios where, you know, Charlie's over there and she's got a stick. She's about to pick up a stick and it looks pretty sharp and I'm not too happy about it. She looks at me, yes, good girl. And I get her to come over to me. She's gone away from the stick, right? So, or, you know, a pile of whatever that is just really disgusting that you don't want her to have. Use that positive interrupter. Or um, she's just about to jump on grandma who just walked into the door. Get her to come to you. It's a happy tone. And the dog learns that this is a great thing. This is something rewarding. All right. Any questions about attention? Important to reward it in all ways. Like anytime you're getting, when you're learning this behavior, anytime you're getting attention, you should just reward it. You could be cooking, like let's say you're making pasta in the, in the kitchen and you know, your dog just is lying down then suddenly your dog looks up at you. Yes, good job, go ahead. Even if it's just praise, right. go ahead and use that. You don't have to have treats. You have multiple dogs. I mean, you have one you're trying to train. Mm -hmm. You see the treats and all of a sudden, like in, like in your video, the second one yep. comes over. Yep. 
you know, in my case, it's usually my 14 year old. Right. And it's like, mm -hmm. student, why is she getting treats? Yep. I have no So does she know settle? So what I would do in that scenario is I would first work with the dogs, you know, as separately as I possibly could for at least a short amount of time and try to teach them a place command, settle place or bed, where you could send one of them to go sit on that bed, work with the other dog, and still reward the other dog for staying in place in that settle. So you could be training both at the same time. Yeah, you could also do a, a calm, stuff calm, yeah. and give it to the other dog, go, or just go yeah. in a separate room, mm -hmm. just completely. And, yep. You know, or put the dog in the crate if you use the crate, the one that you're not working, yeah. working on. Yeah, my 14 year old seems to get a lot of liberties. I think he trained me very well. Yeah, they usually do. They usually do, yeah. But the Kong is also self-rewarding, too. So they're calm. They're licking. They're eating that. Um, they're doing well. So her question was, how do you train um, two dogs at one time? And uh, a couple of things that you can do, you can use a Kong, a stuffed Kong, where they're licking and, and chewing on that Kong so they're being calm in another area. You can teach place or go to the mat um, and still be rewarding that dog for staying in place while you're training with the other dog. Um, and then you could also, you know, put them in a safe place, put them in a crate, put them in another room, have somebody take them for a walk, all of those things. But when you're using the clicker, mm -hmm. and I mean, as the sound of the clicker, doesn't the second dog who's not doing anything? You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. No, I mean, they know that training's going on and they get this happiness, but your attention's not on them. Uh -huh. So they, they know when attention is being directed towards them, but you'd be surprised that they... They know what the intention is and who it's aimed for. Even in a room with group classes, you never see a dog turning and looking at someone else for clicking. Yeah, you just don't see it happen. Okay, all right, impulse control. Um, so there are many different things about impulse control. So uh, maybe you've heard of say please. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but that's, you know, you can use sit or other known behaviors, give paw, um, just sitting there calmly, lying down, those kind of things for common routine rewards like going outside, going for a walk, getting fed, um, getting in the car, getting out of the car, all of those different things. There's leave it. Um, so we're asking for self-control. Um, so we're going to do some leave it exercises that we'll show you. It's also really great to have this for safety purposes. You know, if there's something that's, uh, you know, you drop the Tylenol on the floor. That's scary, right? It's scary that your dog could just lunge for that. So you want to be able to have that leave it command on cue. Uh, wait, wait at the doors for food, for petting. Um, use every training opportunity you can possibly get to teach them to be patient and say please for everything. Um, there are resources um, that you can alternatively use that are not like everyday resources like going through a door or food or petting. Um, toys, treats, you know. A, play, a game of play, a game of tug, anything like that that you can use too. Try to really evaluate in your mind what your dog's top 10 are. What are, the, what are the best things that are motivating? You know, we work, you know, we all work for some type of paycheck or at least some type of emotional gratitude from what we're doing. Um, so why do we expect our dogs not to want some type of, you know, reward? Okay. And then there's doggy zen, which I really like. And this is where your dog makes the choice, again, without being told to do so. So the dog makes the choice to be patient and have some self-control. So I'll show you that as well. OK, lack of patience and controlling impulses. Why? Well, there's something inside of value that I really, really want, and I'm going to go get it. That's basically it. The dog does grab, rush, take it. They storm, they demand, they pout. They do all sorts of things to try to get at it. If they get the object, you know, which is the resource of their, uh, of the, their desire, then that's the consequence. So they learn, well, I'm going to do that again and throw a tantrum. You know, it's like, it's like the two-year-old in the, in the store who's pouting to get, you know, a piece of candy that's at eye level. And, you know, mommy says, no, 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 no. And then, a tam you know, a temper tantrum proceeds. And it just depends on how the parent handles it from there, whether or not it's going to reoccur in the future. Okay. How do we solve it? We're going to teach them patience, teach them self-control, teach the dog that if you make good choices, you will get good things. You know, it's n you're not being, um, you know, we're not putting you on an island and keeping everything from you, but actually you're going to get great things if you listen to me and you learn how to control yourself. Uh, use it in everyday life. It's like the, the best thing that you can do for your dog is to create boundaries and consistency in your actions. It's, you know, if you have no training whatsoever and you just do that, 
<laughs> it's the best thing that you can do. Yeah. Okay. okay, doggy's end. So this is sort of, you know, it's your choice. So I've got a treat in both hands. And this is Brandy, okay? When she goes for my hand, I close it. When she stays back, I open it. But if she goes for it, I close it. I open it. If she doesn't go for it, yes, and she gets rewarded, okay? She, she'll get it so much faster. See her hold herself back? <laughs> Yeah, this is a really fun game. It's something yeah. you could do on the couch or anything like that, and you're teaching them to control. Yeah. Good job. Uh, 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 Good. That's okay. Baby. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Just click next. Yeah. They don't want to see me doing that. Right? Nothing. Uh, nothing. I'm just giggling, laughing, and smiling. <laughs> I gave her nothing. It yeah, was all so her choice. You know, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, a couple of months ago, my husband and I ordered pe chicken barbecue pizza, pizza, and I was moving a slice from the box onto the plate, and a piece of chicken, uh, no lie, this big, fell off the pizza onto the floor. Both of my dogs came from God knows where, <laughs> <laughs> and I said, leave it, and they both stopped. And I really, to be honest with you, it was a, that's a high value. Thing. I did not think that they were going to stop. They both stopped dead in their tracks and stopped and looked at me. And I was like, oh, okay. So I picked up the barbecue chicken, I washed the barbecue off, and I gave it to them. I'm like, they had to. They had to. But I picked it up off the floor. Before, you know, once you say leave it to a dog, they need to leave it. They can't then get that. But I picked it up, I washed it, I waited a couple of minutes, and then I gave them the chicken. But that's, you know, that you want to be, especially if you drop onions, grapes, yeah, you chocolate. Know, chocolate, mm. garlic, anything that can be poisonous, you yeah. want them to be able to stop dead in their tracks. That's right. not as high value. So you can graduate um, that particular behavior that I just did with just sitting there into the coffee table, right? Yeah. So you just cover it. So you have the, the treat covered. They know it's there. Sniff, 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 sniff. They move, the moment they move away, you peekaboo. You show them, okay? They're going to instinctively go for it the first, first time, minimally, maybe the second time. You cover it. They move back again. You open it. If they go for it, you cover it. They move back again. You open it. This time they stay back. Yes, good job. Pick up that treat, put it away, give a different treat. Because you don't want them to understand to go for that treat that's on the coffee table, but they're going to get a reward for being patient and not going for it. So that's a really good thing to do. But definitely start off with it in your hand and then go to the coffee table. Because dogs. Um, Give them another treat. A different treat, yeah. not the one that's on the coffee table. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is leave it. So this is the difference between the Zen exercises and the leave it exercises is I was never asking for it. Okay, so it's a behavior that. I want the dog to think and make a choice not to take something, um, not to go, not to mug me <laughs> for food and nuzzle me and try to get the food out of my hand, not to steal food from the coffee table. Don't name it. When you're working on the coffee table, don't name it. Just work on this exercise. Never give the cue because you want your dog not to do it when you're in the kitchen and you know, and you left, you know, you left popcorn on the table or something like that. You want your dog not to, you know, to resist that urge. All right, so this is leave it basics. So and we start off a treat in your hand. The second that the dog moves away from the treat in your hand. And Allie is saying leave it. Is she saying leave it at this point? At first you don't. At first you don't say it. So see him? He's being really demanding. He's getting agitated. He's pouting. He in particular, this is Remus, Remus in particular too, he actually pouts, he goes Phew. <laughs> Yes, good job there. So he's learning to stay away from him. So that's the first thing. So the treat's in your hand, you're, you can show them, but hand is closed. They're going to sniff, 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 sniff. The second that they move away, you're going to click. And then you'll go ahead and grab a different treat and treat them. Okay. Then the next step to leave it, oops, oh, one. Let's see. That's yep. No. Yep. Go to the next one. Yep. <coughs> okay. This is what we call leave it peekaboo. So this is with your hand open. This is Minnie. So she's already done step one. And so if she came forward, you would just close your hand. So she's playing peekaboo. Uh 
Yeah. And you can expand on this by adding, you have to look at me before I'm going to click. Okay, so don't do that at first because you just want her to look to move away from your hand at first. But then just wait for the intentional, I'm looking at you. So that they learn to seek your advice. Seek, like, you know, what do you want me to do in order to get that? Okay. This is uh, much more difficulty. So after you've practiced those two steps, you know, at least like five or six times in different sessions and they're doing really well and they're leaving it 100% of the time, then go ahead and add the cue. Okay. You can do that. So you're going to, you know, say the cue, present. When they do it, you're going to click and treat. All right. So now we're on leave it. So this is Remus again we're working with. So I was tossing the treat. I don't know if you can see it here. And asking him to leave it. So things that are moving are much harder to leave for a dog because they want to chase it. He stopped himself there. I'm going to wait until he turns and looks at me. Yeah, good. <laughs> good job, Remus. Good job. And then what I decided to do here was I started to throw in a, you know, stay and go pick it up, have him stay there while I came back. So I taught him another additional piece of patience while I was doing that exercise. So this is where it's, you know, when, you're, when your dog is ready and for increased difficulty, you can do that. That being said, don't throw a whole chicken on the floor and expect him to do well the first time that you do it. <laughs> Maybe try something a little bit more bland. <laughs> okay. Now, see that time he sort of, he went for it and I just stood still. I didn't pull him. I didn't yank him. I let him sort of get to the end and say, oh, no, that's not worth it. I'll just come back. I'll get, another, I'll get a reward faster. Question? In, in this particular video, are you saying leave it for the Yeah, so I've already named it at this point. So I'm saying leave it and I'm tossing it. And then I'm going to bring it, you know, later on in this training session, what I would do is I would go ahead and just plant something and just walk by it. And then as soon as, you know, he sees it, I'm going to say leave it. And I'm going to wait for him to not pull me towards that object. And then I'm going to click and treat when he turns his attention on me. Okay. Yeah. Same one, yep. Okay. Okay. Any questions on, on leave it and raising the criteria for leave it? You have a question? Okay. Okay. All right. So you can do, so there are so many different degrees of, you know, difficulty with leave it. You want to try different objects. Like there are some dogs that are paper hoarders, you know, they want any type of, you know, tissue paper or paper towels or, um, socks. My dog loves socks for whatever reason. So I, you know, sometimes I use the socks as an advantage. I'll tie it around a tug toy <laughs> and play with it so that, you know, find out what's motivating. Um, and I only use my husband's socks, so that's okay. <laughs> that's what I do. Okay. Okay. So the say please uh, protocol, which I was telling you about, um, Grisha Stewart um, is the, it, you know, she named the say please. There's also nothing in life is free. Maybe you've heard of those different things. So it's using like everyday rewards that the dog seeks in order to teach them, um, you know, good, polite, patient manners. Um, maybe you, I'm sure you've all heard of the PREMAC principle. No? Okay. So the PREMAC pr principle basically says that the chance to do something that the dog is more likely to do, such as going outside, going for a walk, et cetera, putting on the leash, will reinforce a behavior um, the dog is less likely to do on its own. Okay, so sitting and waiting before I put the leash on. Um, the leash is the reinforcer. We're going to get to go for a walk, okay? But if you sit, sit and wait patiently, that's, you know, that's what we're asking for. It's really easy to do. Use the cues that your dog already knows. Don't make it difficult. Don't make, you know, make it, you know, jump through the hoop and run over there and turn around and come back. Make it, make it a simple sit and wait um, for anything. So, or give paw and then I'll pet you or, you know, lie down, then you can come up on the couch. All sorts of those things, okay? So those are things typically that they would just take impulsively, such as running through the door, um, jumping up on you to get the leash put on because they're so excited and they're clawing at the door. How about sitting and waiting patiently? And then I put the leash on, then you sit and wait at the door, and then we're gonna, I'm gonna walk through and I'm gonna say, okay, and I'm gonna allow you to come through, okay? And then we get to go for a walk. That's really, really rewarding, okay. Okay, so this is me doing, um, this is Brandy again. We're doing wait at the door, and Brandy's a superstar, so I, I'm just gonna preface this with, if Brandy, so if Brandy was in a sit, and I asked her to wait, and I started to open the door, if she had gotten up at all, like her bottom up, I would have closed the door. Obviously, not with her in it. She's far back <laughs> enough. Um, I would have closed the door. 
and I'm not saying anything. I can, I can say, nope, too bad, uh-uh. Um, you can give her a lost reward marker if you like to, if you feel like you need to say something. Otherwise, just closing the door says, oh, you're not going to get to that resource. You're not going to get to go through. So we'll go ahead and just show the clip. Okay. So I move her back because I don't want her mugging the door either. I ask her to wait. I'm watching her. If she got up, I would have closed the door. And then I gave her the release cue. Okay. And you see how I kind of crouched down a little bit to get her to come with me and go forward? All right. So I said, okay. And then I came forward and she got to go through. And she was wagging her tail. She was all happy about just going through a gate. I didn't even give her a treat, right? So it's the, it's the every, things in everyday life that you don't consider a reward. They are rewarding. Use those to your advantage. You don't always have to have treats in your pocket to do things, you know? Um, going outside to go to the bathroom is rewarding. Okay. Any questions about that? Particular Are one? you using clickers throughout this whole time? I did not use a clicker in that particular instance. Brandy's really well trained. She's, yeah, she could, I still mm -hmm. use, we still use the yes mark, reward mm -hmm. marker for her, but I don't use a clicker. If I'm mm -hmm. training a new behavior, then I'll pull out the clicker. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, the behaviors yeah. that they, her and her sister Reese already know, I don't use the clicker, I just use yes. So the question was, did we use a clicker um, in that instance? And because Brandy, the dog that we're using in that video, is really well trained, she already knows these behaviors, we were just using yes um, as the marker for that. But if it was a new behavior, we would have used the clicker. Okay, Okay. here's little mini me again. And um, we're going to do um, sit and wait to have her meal. Now, I didn't have a meal, so I just had a couple treats in a, in a bowl for her, but you're going to be able to see that she needs to sit patiently. First couple times you do this requires some patience on your end. Basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, you know, I've got the food in a bowl. I ask for a sit. I ask for a wait. I start going down. She's going to get up. Moment, again, same thing as the door. The moment her bum gets up, I get up. Start going down again. Up. Oh. Again, until I can get it on the floor. She hasn't gotten up yet and say, okay. I'm not going to make her wait too long the first time that I'm doing it. It's just going to be quick. I'm, I'm looking to get her successful so she can get a reward. <laughs> Clearly, she had not been taught this before. <laughs> <laughs> to no fault of her own. So close. <laughs> yeah, she was close. Look at her attention, though. She's just so focused. She's a stomach on little legs. <laughs> Bum went up. I guarantee you, the next time I did that, she would have cut that time in half. And then the next time, cut it in a quarter. Mm -hmm. So um, that was a lot of, she needed a lot of patience because that was mm -hmm. really hard for her. Yep. So my question 50 is, seconds of patience. Yeah. <laughs> my, my question is, is, when you're doing a training mm -hmm. and it goes beyond what the dogs are capable of waiting, they start getting frustrated, mm -hmm. should you just stop the training at that point? Or should you continue with it? So the question is, if the dog is becoming frustrated, um, when do you you know, do you stop the training that you're doing? So I guess, I guess one point for clarification would be, you know, what do you mean by the dog is frustrated? Describe the behavior that you're seeing. Yep. So um, my dog, she, once I know she's, it's like, I've had enough, I can't do this anymore, she'll start to bark at me. And I can tell, you know, her focus is gone, she's barking, she's basically telling me, I am so frustrated with you. I don't want to do this anymore. So usually I stop what I'm doing and I say, okay, I'll walk away because I'm not going to get, give in to her barking mm -hmm. at me, but I will walk away. And then at another time I'll pick up the training again, but mm -hmm. I will stop it. Okay. So, so um, she's only 10 months, so yeah. you know, she's still very young. Okay. So your, your dog is barking at you, saying, I'm fr you think, saying, you're, I'm frustrated, I'm not getting the treats fast enough? Yeah, I'm just tired of what you're trying to do. Okay. So I think the rewards are probably not happening as frequently as the dog would like. However, on that same note, we don't want to give in to the demand behavior of the barking by rewarding that. Removing your attention is the best thing for 20 seconds. 
turn, try to come back. Ask for something the dog knows and can do successfully versus what you're working on that was too hard a minute ago. Yes. Get a sit. Sit. Yes, good job. Get them back in the game. Get them motivated again. Just for the end of that session, to end it on a successful note, do the things the dog, you know the dog knows is going to give you. And then just end it with, yeah, good job. Because you know, you that's it. To, I mean, when I see her getting frustrated, I don't want to feed her yeah. or treat her. Right. For anything that she's done because she has not completed yeah. it yep. the way she's And you're probably to. getting frustrated too. So the dog, yeah. So you don't want to reward the dog for that barking or anything like that. So yeah, remove attention. Doesn't have to be forever. 20 seconds. If you need to, just say, too bad. Go in the other room. Come back. Try the, you know, the behavior that you know is going to occur that your dog can be successful at. Do that again. They're going to learn that, you know, yes, I do these behaviors. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get rewarded. I don't have to be demanding, but that's, yeah, definitely demanding yeah. behavior, yeah. So impulse control exercises, critical. Okay, okay. Any more, any questions about um, say please? Okay, all right, pulling on the leash. Who has a dog that pulls? So yeah, it's a very common problem, right? Really, really common. So what? Just curious, what do you tr what do you try in the blue? I'm sorry, what's your name? Yeah. In, beh right behind you. Uh, sorry, Kathleen. Um, Kathleen. Uh, well, just pounds, so. Yeah. <laughs> do you use a harness? Do you use uh, anything? Martingale. A martingale. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you could mechanically, well, you know, the band aid, the quick band aid before you start to work on training is get an, um, some type of front clip harness. Mm -hmm. um, would be really really helpful probably, and just make sure that it's a good fit. Two finger rule. You can fit two fingers underneath. Um, you know, at all points. Okay. Yeah, she's a squirrely one. I, I, yeah. I'm actually concerned that she could squirrel her way out of it. Because you can always clip it to the leash. Like, uh, we, use, we use a little trick. We get a little, uh, sometimes get a carabiner clip, and we clip them together. Okay. Yep, and then we clip to that. Okay. Yep, so that's a really, really helpful trip. Um, you can also just clip the front, uh, front of the harness to the actual collar if they reach. You know, sometimes you get a dog with a long neck though, so that's not going to work. But the carabiner is a great thing, and you know, 99 cents you can't go wrong at the hardware store, so it's very helpful. Okay, so why do they do it? They see an opportunity to get something that's rewarding, get to the tree, get to the person, get to the food, get you know to fun, get to the park, get to the neighbor's house who has a dog. Um, get to the neighbor who always has bacon in their pocket. All of those different <laughs> things can be very rewarding. Uh, the behavior is the dog pulls, gets to the reward fat, you know, pretty fast. And then the consequence is you get yanked. <laughs> Hopefully you don't get hurt. But the dog gets the reward faster and they learn pulling leads to good things. So that's why it occurs. How do we solve it? We just talked about the um, front clip harness. Uh, the gentle leader, so institute those so you don't get too frustrated. And then you have got to be fun. We're boring. We are boring, boring, boring bipeds. So when you're training this, we've got to be fun. You've got to act a little crazy. So come to class if you like to get a little quirky. <laughs> you know, we bring, we bring everybody out of their shell a little bit and use their voices. It's got to be mo much more fun. Um, you can imagine if you're on four you know, if you're on four legs, you can go much faster than we can go when we're walking. So, um, you know, they're bored standing right next to you. That's just frankly it. Practice steps um, in all rooms and start off indoors. When I, I say indoors, it's not because it's raining outside, but because I want to make sure that you're at the lowest uh, or no distraction level when you're starting to do this. So that's how you should start to train anything with no distractions or as little distractions as possible. And then you can work your way up. Then take it outside, go in the driveway. Don't, don't even plan to go for a walk. This session is strictly for practicing. Just, you're just gonna walk your driveway today. And then maybe the next day you're gonna venture out and take you know, 10 feet out of your driveway. Build, build it successfully. If you create the foundation, you're gonna be more successful more quickly. Okay. Um, go on a quiet street then. And then you can advance into harder distracting environments like you know, um, the park or something like that. You can work on those. Again, never, ever, ever take a step forward for pulling, ever. If you do, it's gonna confuse your dog to say, oh, well, jackpot, I got to go forward that time. You know, it's random, but it still occurs, so they're gonna go ahead and do it. Um, okay. You can, you know, you can then randomize the rewards, like after they've learned 
to be patient and have that loose leash, you can then randomize those rewards and not give those rewards all the time and just give praise, you know, occasionally. And that's what we work to build up to as well. Um, turn and go the other direction. So I don't have a video of this, but basically just go out in your driveway. You have your dog with you. You start walking, your dog pulls. Turn, go the other way. Oh, it starts pulling again. Turn, go the other way. I'm like, what is that game with the, the gun and the pointing and then just go back and forth? Or was, whatever. It's, uh, that's what I feel like I'm doing when I'm doing it. If you do this for five minutes, your dog is going to feel the point of tension on the leash where you turn. Okay, so he's going to stop. He's going to stop and turn and look at you. And I turn. And then I turn because he's pulling. And he's going to start to learn we only get to go forward when I'm not pulling or when the leash is loose. All right, so that's when I'm first setting this up for myself, my only criteria is that that uh, leash better be loose. You don't have to be right here in a heel position, but it better be loose. There better be a J or a curve in my leash. If there's not a curve in my leash, we're stopping. With puppies, when they're younger, a lot of people can just stop and the dog will come back as well and you can reward them for that attention. Sometimes the adult dogs are a little bit harder, so you really just have to make it very clear to them and turn the other direction. And they've learned it. They've been practicing it for so much longer, that's why it's a little bit more challenging. Okay, so Charlie was helping me out here. She's very excited. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the attention. Yep. Look at how she's yep. looking at Yep, so we just worked on attention, right? Look at that. <laughs> and she said hi. <laughs> Okay, so I break it down a little different than a lot of people do with loose leash walking. So what we do at Life is Dog, yeah, she's like, I'm just going to go get that behind you, Mom. No, it's not going to work for you. Um, we walk backwards because the dog will instinctively follow you when you are walking backwards. And I'm clicking and treating her as she's moving towards me. So I click. And then if I'm just, you know, not capable because I'm, I'm not graceful in any way, then you can stop and give the treat. And then as you get a little bit more accomplished, you can keep moving. Click, treat, click, treat, okay? And then I asked for a sit. She would give me an automatic sit over time where I wouldn't even have to ask for it. So anytime I stopped, she would sit, okay? So that's step one. You practice that indoors, practice that in your driveway, practice that in all different locations, all different rooms of your house. You're gonna look like a crazy person, but it's fantastic. <laughs> it's gonna really, really work. Um, has anybody ever tried that technique? Okay. okay, so phase two and phase three. So there's only three, so I'm not going to have you doing cartwheels with your dog or anything like that, but you're going to do a little bit more work. All right, so after the back, oh, <laughs> you like that, huh? After walking backwards, we're going to go sideways. So the dog is going to be coming with us. Click treat, sideways, click treat, sideways, click treat, okay? And then the final stage is after we practice that, it's going to be really easy now because this dog is like, she's crazy. i got to watch her. Which way is she going to go next? As soon as I turn, she's going to stay with me. Okay. Again, I'm not graceful, so please be nice to me. <laughs> and see how she's just staying with me? And if at any point the dog decides to go in another direction and pull, freeze. Mm -hmm. Turn into a tree, wait until they turn back and look at you, give them a click and a treat, and then start going sideways again. Mm -hmm. Good point. Okay, now I went forward. See her? And I am putting my hand behind my back because I don't want to be watching that. And I'm, if you guys can see, I'm holding the, uh, the leash in the way that Dana described. And I'm treating with my left hand. Good job. And she gave me a sit when I stopped. Let's go. And this, Char Charlie's seven months in this. So, I mean, that's pretty good, right? For a seven month old puppy. And the automatic sit. Good. Right? So she can pick it up. You know, she's a puppy. She can pick it up. These are easy, easy methods that are just, you know, broken down and they're kind of fun. It's fun to do. And they're successful. Okay. That's it. All right. Then you start to up your ante after you practice all of that into various locations. Here we were practicing with um, our levels class in level three. 
Um, I think Arnold was in there too. Yeah, he is. He's yeah, in the left. Arnold is in there. So he's an adoptee from uh, Bay Path as well. So Lizzie and her husband were in there too. Um, but basically, what we did was we wanted them to practice in the classroom, everyone keeping their dogs calm in a down or a sit position while each individual would walk through, basically like a crowd, you know, walking through a crowd to keep control, keep them with you, loose leash, have them focus on you and pay attention. It's a lab. This is a lab. And she's 10 months in this, yep. in this video. Mm -hmm. Do they learn quicker as puppies and close to an older dog? No, I don't think so. No, I think the, the, click is a, uh, the clicker and the marker reward is really remarkable and applies to any age. Question. What do you do when you get to this point if you have a reactive dog? So we would work in reactive dog class first. Yeah, so it's by themselves. Yep, with, a, with one of our dogs, with one of our neutral dogs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the question was, what do you do if the dog is reactive? And um, this wouldn't be the exact setting that you would want to put a reactive dog into until we work on it separately. And then we work with our neutral dogs to go ahead and counter condition and desensitize exposure to another dog. Then try to get them to work in the same room with a dog, even walking with another dog, um, all those and things. So. Brandy a lot and Reese a lot more Brandy than Reese because um, she doesn't. If your dog reacts to her, she won't. She doesn't react. care. She doesn't yeah. Care. She won't react back if he lunges. She wanted to have a reactive dog in a positive way, though. Yeah. I mean, she would just want to play. She just, yep. like, she got kicked out of So what's the reward? Class. What's the reward? <laughs> what, what's the reward for her for doing that? For what? For jumping towards the other dog. Does she, she, there's no reward. There is a reward. Oh, what? So if she's jumping toward another dog, right? Yeah. She, gets, she, gets she gets to, gets to, to meet the dog. Right. <laughs> Right, 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 right. Yeah. So there's a reward. Yeah. So what would what should you do to, do then, if the reward is that she gets to the other dog by jumping? What should you do? Just turn around and walk away. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. She's so strong. Exactly. So see, you got the tools now <laughs> to yeah. figure it out. Sometimes yeah. it's I'm not even trying to meet the dog. It's walk past the dog. Yep. Like, okay. Watch yep. me, and I have. And right. I but if she starts to pull, treat. turn around and go the other way, and then try turn around, try again. Keep her attention. Yeah, that's reactivity. So yeah, yeah, so that's the specific reactivity that we're talking about. So, so reactive can be negative and positive. Sure, 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 sure. It can be. I don't know what the heck to do with myself. I'm just gonna go off. And, right. right. You know. Most of the time, the dog's behavior, the way the dogs react, is because they they haven't been necessarily taught something else to do. So in a reactive class, instead of lunging and jumping to the other dog, whether it's a playful or an aggressive, we teach them what else do we want, you know, what else? Look at me, look, look at, at me. me. What else should I do? So in that situation, they see another dog, their, their immediate response is gonna be to turn and look at mom or dad and say, what do you want me to do? And that's what we teach you in the reactive class. Again, whether it's a, a vicious, mm -hmm. a vicious reactive dog or just an a overexcited dog that wants to play, mm -hmm. you know, and either one can get you into trouble. I went into a dog park once with both of my dogs. One of them is higher energy, um, just a little bit more of a spaz than the other. And I wasn't really paying attention. I just opened that she and she was so excited when I opened the gate to the dog park that she got attacked. Okay, so you, you, entering into that excited state in another group of dogs that have already been established, they've been in there for whatever long, um, they didn't like that excitement and they retaliated to her. So it doesn't matter whether it's an aggressive excited or a playful excited, it's gonna get them into trouble. And it was my own fault because I didn't make her sit and wait before and calm her down before I went into the park. You know, so, that, you know, we just want to teach them a different way to behave. Does that make sense? Yeah. But we're going to show you that, too, like a good greeting exercise. Yeah. We're yeah. going to show you that. Yes? I've actually taken a reactive dog class with my um, great West Side Girl Border Collie Mix, and she did great in the class. Mm -hmm. But do you ever get, then at home, not so much, and do you ever get to the point where you don't have to always have a bunch of treats with you and have to keep treating, treating, yes. treating to get them to ignore the dog. Do you ever get to that point? Yes, yes, yes you do. I, I can say so, and I can say so from experience, because I had a reactive dog. Do you, 
eventually get them? It's by practicing in all sorts of situations and working below their threshold so that they're not practicing the behavior. So by below their threshold, I mean... Right, yeah, yes. so distance yeah. is your number one friend, right? If your dog is just not handling the situation, just try taking a few feet back. It's going to make a world of difference. And the hard, hardest thing is when you have like three dogs, so you have to work them one at a time. You do. You have to work them one at a time at first. Yeah, yes. yeah. but we've worked dogs in, in pairs, and even one of them was deaf. Yeah. Right. So we right. were, you know, yeah. it, it can definitely be done. So if you have another dog at home and they play rough and tough, mm -hmm. is that bad? I mean, should you stop them oh. from doing that? Is that what's causing no. the reaction? No. No. Okay. No. 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 Yep. What do you do in that situation with a reactive dog who doesn't want any kind of like edible treat whatsoever? Do they like toys? Do they like to play tug? Do they no, like... No, uh, outside of the house, it's just completely... Do they like squeakers? No, no. Outside, it just seems nothing but... She just wants squirrels. She's so when you, <laughs> say, when you say she Use doesn't that. want any other toys, uh, any other... Uh, she won't respond to treats, what kind of treats are you giving her? Yeah. Um, try the chicken hearts, chicken gizzards, all the different dog yeah. treats. Yeah. Oh, so like steak so doesn't work? So you, have you used real steak or real chicken yeah. or real hot dogs not, and that doesn't... Yeah. Anything. Really investigate your your yeah. your treat. I mean, it should be something like you know, have some prime rib tonight or something, and you know, if you're not vegan, and yeah. save some for the dog. And yeah, or go to the go to the store and get roast beef from mm -hmm. Deli mm -hmm. and use the roast beef. Yep. You know, one of those really, it's got to be a higher, whatever you're offering the dog has got to be a higher value than what it is they want. Yeah. And you need to figure out what that is. And sometimes if you don't have a dog that is very food motivated. It can be more difficult, but it yeah. can be done. It's just going to take longer. You could also use something like a flirt pole. Like if your dog is really motivated by small critters and that kind of thing, you could have, you know, it's something you could probably stick in your back pocket and have some type of flirt pole that you yeah. could pull out, is, sort of like a fishing that? line. I don't know what that is. Um, it's sort of, it looks like a fishing line. You know, it, you know the, um, the, cat the cat teasers uh, yeah. that are out there, yeah. but they're yeah. for dogs. You can, even, you can even, you know, buy the cat teaser if that's going to work yeah. effectively for you. You can even use that. Um, just to get their attention back, just for that critical few seconds to go the other other direction and play a fun game with them. Mm -hmm. But really try to investigate your food rewards. Um, you know, it can be sort of the quickest, fastest way to reward if food can be a motivator. The other thing is you might just be too close to whatever you're yeah. working with. So get some distance and plan to work on these things. Don't make it a surprise event where you're just going to work on it. But like, like you're saying, um Working on it in the home, like in the home, and that, that's a point that we've learned mm -hmm. at the shelter. Is like the work, you gotta work, and you gotta get the attention, like in the house before you go out in the world with all yeah. the squirrels and dogs and everything yeah. else. Like that's the best thing you can do. And you know, at the shelter, there's so many distractions, and you know, the best thing we can do is just work on getting the attention. Because once you get that, once they connect that, mm -hmm. you know, in your yeah. house with no distractions or in a room or wherever. If you don't have that, there's nothing, nothing. Yeah, nothing. You can't right. stop anything else. Right. Chipmunks, dogs, squirrels, yeah. trucks. Like, you need to, right. you know, work right. on that. But it's, I can say just doing it in the shelter environment, which is not a home, but it's something that makes a world of difference. Yeah. And it's something that you can do at home. Yeah, right. and as soon as your dog it's gets everything. to that aha moment where they say, oh, hmm, mom is more, mom or dad, is, they're more interesting than that other thing. Mm -hmm. It's going to get progressively better every single time. Right. But once you get to that, it's getting to that aha moment. So you yep. need to figure out what's more motivating to your dog to pay attention to you than that other thing. So my two dogs are hunting dogs. They love deer. We go hiking before I was on crutches, whatever. We're hiking all the time. They see a deer, a squirrel, a, boar, a bird, or whatever, and they they're going to take off. They take off nine out of ten times. I can whistle and they'll come back to me. They'll turn around and come back to me. But I got to that point where every single time they came to me, they got a reward. Didn't even if I called them or if I not, or if I didn't. So at some point, they had that aha moment that, huh, mom's, a, mom's just a candy machine. Every time I go to her, she gets, I get a treat. Mm -hmm. So you have to get to that point and then it gets easier and easier right. and easier. But also a good reactive program is going to take that into account that, yeah, we're in this room and it's all quiet and <laughs> we're working with one dog. And that's why Dana and I, when we do our reactive, you know, based upon the progression of the dog, we then take it to a field trip. Yeah. 
you know. But we don't go to, you know, Callahan Park and <laughs> submerge the dog in, you know, 80 dogs. We don't do that. We go to a private location, again, with our own neutral dogs, then work like that. Then we can build up. We have some that we can then take to, you know, Galani Park or to Cushing or various locations, or their neighborhood, if the neighborhood is where they're having the most problems. So it's got to, your program has to be a little bit in, individualized, but again, it, it is it's about practicing in all those locations. And we do, we do, yeah. Any tool that you can get, a sit, a touch, a trick, anything that you can get to get them to focus and be with you in the moment versus being ready to, you know, be defensive towards the other dog or to react. Because it, it's worked for them for so long. They get big, they get barky, they blow up. Typically, the other person goes away. You're dying of embarrassment, and the other person <laughs> goes away. You know, I've been there. I felt that way before I have the knowledge that I have. I felt that same way. It can be done. I mean, I can tell you that, I know. I know from experience that it can be successful. So I have sort of a twist to what we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. So you have a dog that's, you know, very friendly, very good, you're out yep. on the walk, and you encounter an aggressive dog. What okay. is the best thing to do? Turn, um, my turn and go away. Yeah. Happy tone, go. Yeah, on or off uh -huh. leash that you encounter the aggressive dog. Well, I, I was thinking even on a leash, but, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, I don't want her to get afraid of other dogs. Yeah. I don't want to yeah. make her, let her see my fear. So let me just say the question again. Yeah. All right, so let me just repeat your question. So if there is an aggressive dog approaching you, so you, you mean you've had experience with this dog being aggressive before, barking, that kind of thing, and you don't want your dog to become afraid of that other dog, but you don't want to be around that other dog, what do you do? Um, so just happy tone. Let's go. Go the other way. Just go the other sorry. direction. Cross the street. <laughs> Be happy. Pretend there's nothing wrong here. There's nothing wrong. And just, you know, mostly what you have to do is you have got, you have to calm yourself. That's, yeah. You have to, but we teach, yeah. you know, that's what we teach in class too is we don't forget to say, hey, let's just take a breath. Breathe. Because they can feel the extension yeah. of your arm on the leash and that you're tense. Right. And they can pick up on that. They can pick up on all yeah. that. Your, your feelings. Your first response is, Oh my word, look at this dog coming and you get tensed up. Yeah. And that tension gets goes to the dog like Nancy yeah. said. But if you just say, hmm, okay, come on, let's go. Take a deep breath and turn in the other direction, that mm -hmm. tension is gonna leave because now you're walking yep. away from a crazy dog that's yep. lunging. You know. Mm -hmm. So it, it is very important to kinda take that second and take a deep breath and you just walk in. Yep. Or step to the side, get attention. Yep. Okay, sit. Oh, what a good dog. What a good dog. Let them go by. Let, get get out of the way. I mean, you can't control their dog. Get out of the way. I don't want to. Yeah, right, right. You can't do that. You can't make it force other people to do things. So, um, you know, another thing that you can teach too, like if your dog maybe is a little bit reactive, is teach like the search cue. So you can, you know, search, toss treats down, you know, in the grass, on the ground, let them sniff for it. Teach them it's a fun game to do, you know, while a dog goes by. Distract them. Okay. Oh, I did that one. Can I just ask on that? Sure. What if that other, that other very aggressive dog is off leash? Can you want to Yeah, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> it's pretty scary. There's nothing you can do, unfortunately. Like, you know, you may want to carry some type of, you know, emergency citronella or something like that on you. Um, you know, if you tend to go to a, par a dog park where a lot of dogs are off leash. On the road. Oh. Sometimes we yeah. 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 If you have, if you're carrying treats, you can also just toss the treats to the other dog and yep. walk in the other go with the other way. Eating exactly. The treats. Yeah. Um, you well, know, you try like to, just to turn your back and have your dog. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You can get your dog behind you. Behind like we do teach yeah. a dog like stay behind and just put your legs out and then they just yeah. get behind you so that the other dog is sort of blocked from that intention of getting to them. And then, you know, toss the treats away and then go in the other direction, yeah. get away. Yeah, or even, mm -hmm. you know, if the other dog, you can even just, you know, hopefully there's some training that this other dog has had and you can even say to the dog, hey, stop. Mm -hmm. You know, throw the treats and walk away. Mm -hmm. Maybe just the sound of your voice yep. will get them to, yeah. sit, to, to kind of get them out of that, that focusing on your dog. But the second thing yeah. is if he is aggressive, you should probably call the call, call, yeah. Yeah. call animal control just so at least they can you know, talk to the people about the behavior, you know, yeah. if it's dangerous, because yeah. yeah, you don't no, want to see that. There's no real quick yeah. 
fix for that. It's kind of you you um, you need to kind of pull out whatever whatever possible stops you can do to get yep. that dog to. Yep. Not yeah, because we, you know, you can't stop and do a training session with the other dogs, so there's not much you can <laughs> yeah. do there. Okay. Any other questions? We'll go on to jumping. Jumping. Okay. Person comes toward the dog. The dog excited, jumps up on the person. That's the behavior. Um, the consequence: they get to be closer to you. They get to get up. They get to see you. There's physical attention, even if it's negative attention. Pushing down. Stop it. Cut it out. You know, all the things that people say. Um, when they come in your house and the dog is jumping on them. How do you solve it? Move your attention. So I say cross your arms just because you're just going to avoid touching them and giving them that attention. So cross your arms, remove your attention, turn around if you need to. If you need to, leave the room if you have to with the jumping. Uh, avoid eye contact. Don't talk to them because it's all rewarding. It's all attention in some way. You can say, uh-uh, nope, too bad. Turn away. Give it about 20 seconds, come back, try again. Dog jumps again. You've just gotta be very consistent, turn. They're gonna get it. It's sort of like that weight exercise with the bowl. It's the same thing of going and coming, going and coming. You keep on practicing that. Uh, reward sitting or four feet on the floor. Like if you just can't get the sit out of your dog um, for this particular exercise, just reward the fact that they have four feet touching the floor. Okay. How do you so that, jumping on other we're gonna show you that. Yeah, so you have to practice good greetings. Like you have got to practice, you know, walking, walking in through all different kinds of doors. You have to practice um, dogs meeting, you know, or, and people meeting. You have to practice all of those things, keep their attention, keep them focused, ask them for a sit. They get rewarded for sitting nicely, paying attention to you, and then, okay, bye-bye. Okay. Um, Oops, sorry. Was there anything else that I missed on that? Okay. Yeah. Practice, practice, pra practice. Start off in small <laughs> steps. Don't go too fast. All right. Okay. So this is um, a good greeting video. Dana and myself. Okay. And I've, I've got the dog that we're trying to control. That's her other dog. Okay. See, I asked for a sit. So I had to lure her a bit. She's so excited to see her mom. So I have to be very high on the rewards there. Good. So, and even the other dog was going around, but I was able to hold her attention. So yeah, this is the beginning practice, you know, of doing all this. It's not that I'm gonna constantly have to have a treat in her face every time that I meet someone, but if I practice this, I can build up to, okay, I've got her attention. And then I'll treat her, like when the exercise is done. And then maybe I'll only randomly treat her after a while. But when we're learning this, you've gotta be, don't be stingy. Give the yeah. treats to get the attention, get the sit. And they'll do the automatics. They'll start doing an automatic sit. Like every time you start approaching someone, you say, hey, how are you? The dog sits. And then the person approaches and you have a conversation. And you know, we try to ask excitable and all of these different things. And then shake hands and, hey, see you later, and then go. Mm -hmm. And she's, she's better on leash with not jumping than off leash. So you know, she'll go up on the days and not see Nancy. And she'll come in. We'll go into the facility. Yeah. And she goes over to Nancy, and she still jumps on her. So are people coming into the house, she's good, she doesn't jump up. She jumps up and down, but she doesn't jump on the people. Yeah. But when we still go to the facility, it's a fun place, they get to work, they get to play, she's excited, she still jumps. So we're still working on that. So it's not, and she's four and a half. So it's not, yeah. you know, it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing thing. But you can get a good greeting. I mean, you, you can get, get a solid good greeting. Okay. This is another example of good greeting. So we were at, um, we were on a field trip with our levels class. We went to Cushing and we were having um, our level three folks work on it. Did it not come in? Yeah. There, there we go. go. Sorry, it's hard, kind of hard to see, but the sun yeah. was in a light. So we set up the cones so that they're at like a good, you know, distance from one another at first greeting, talking to each other, and then what we'll do is after they're doing that successfully, we'll start to bring the cones in, slowly. And then they do the greetings. They keep going back and forth past each other, asking their dogs to sit or down while they're speaking to the other person and then moving on. And then they'll get closer and closer and then they'll actually have contact and they'll shake hands. And then eventually they get to the point where the dog is sitting and you say, can I pet your dog? And if the dog doesn't get up, you go ahead and pet. The other person's keeping focus and keeping attention of their dog, rewarding for staying there, and then move on. So all of those interactions are covered. So we've got a dog, a person, 
uh, petting to, you know, inhibit the jumping. So that's what we do is practice good greetings doing that. And then we practice at the doors um, and the gates as well. So I'd be entering, Dana would have her dog on a leash and um, she would ask her dog to sit. I would be coming through the door. If the dog somehow had the opportunity to jump up and come towards me, I'd just turn around and go back out. But Dana is going to physically be trying to keep her dog's attention, sit, rewarding her for that. And as I'm coming in, rewarding her for staying there. Again, when you're working on this in the beginning, don't be stingy with the rewards and the marking for good behavior of sitting there. Because that's most important. That's going to build it up for them to stay there longer and not get up. And then, you know, pr by practicing it with me, I know I'm going to turn around and go back outside the door. Don't choose to practice it when somebody's coming over randomly because they're not going to know what to do and they're going to reach for your dog and it's going to be rewarding. So you have to set it up so that you can practice. Yeah, and a couple of, you know, to answer the question is what happens when you, you, do, you, do, you have company coming over to get them to stop. There are a couple of things. You can have a bucket of treats as your company walks in and toss the treats on the floor so the dogs are paying attention to the treats as opposed to the person coming in. And the excitement, mm -hmm. the initial excitement is gone by the time they eat the handful of treats mm -hmm. or kibble or whatever. Or the doorbell rings, have a leash near the door. Put your dog on a leash and step on the leash while you're letting your company in. If, there's, if you're stepping on the leash and there's not a long, you know, you don't give them a lot of room, the dogs can't jump. Yep. Okay, so they're going to eventually learn that that's, the behavior is not to jump and stay on all fours and that's when they get the attention. Yeah, good, yeah. that's a good point. So the leash too, you know, you're not yanking on it, you're not pulling it. So, you know, you can be approaching someone or at the door letting someone in and just put the, lie the leash down and step on it to the point at which they could just sit up, right? So you're not holding them down physically or anything right. like that. Just the point that they can sit up and then they try but they, they can't jump. So if you do that, you're already encouraging them to be in a good position to sit. You can reward that sit. So you're setting it up for success. So you can go ahead and use that leash. Would encourage you, like if you are going to practice this, to have them on a leash while you're doing it. You're going to have more control. I wouldn't have let them go yet. Go, yeah. Nope. Yeah. I would wait a good 10 minutes probably yeah. for, of, you know, I would wait for a successful, like five minutes calm, sit down, yeah. you know, have the person come in, sit down, you sit down, everybody's calm, the dog's calm, the dog's lying down now, and then I would release the leash. Mm -hmm. Yep, wait for calm. And then reward the heck out of calm, but yeah. don't go over and say, oh, nice puppy, puppy, and get yeah, them all okay. aroused. Just, yeah. to, they don't need to know it came from you. Yeah. You know, we don't need, we don't need to uh, be rewarded ourselves for that. Just drop it yeah. in between their legs. You know, don't, don't encourage them to get excited again. Yeah. You can also save mm -hmm. your empty peanut butter jars, the glass jars, and when you know you're having company over, put them in. You know, the first round of people start the, start to come, the doorbell rings, you give them the empty jar of peanut butter, it takes them 20 minutes to clean out the inside of it because they're going to try to get as far as they can. And by that point, all of, again, all of the excitement of people coming into their house is gone. They've been hearing all the people talking and, and greetings and, oh my God, I haven't seen you forever, give me a hug. All of that is yeah. now gone and they're done with their peanut butter in. They may just go to their bed and lie down, or they may just walk over and say hello nicely to, mm -hmm. to people. Another really important thing to, to, to remember here is that, you know, we can't reiterate enough, exercise is so important. Yeah. Yeah. It can resolve 80% of behavioral issues. Um, I just want to ask a quick question. What's your opinion on, you know you're having guests, um, putting them in a crate and waiting for your, your guests to come yeah. in, sure. let everything settle, and then let the dogs... Sure. Sure. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Wait for calm. Yep. Mm -hmm. But give them, you know, give them something to do. So it's well, not a punishment. A give them a Kong. Yeah. You know, there are a million ways to make a Kong. You yeah. can use, you, from using their kibble to stuffing it with banana and freezing it if they like banana, to peanut butter, to uh, Greek yogurt. I mean, you can just, if you Google it, th they have like a, over 100 recipes that you can do that are easy and not complicated. Because if it's complicated, you're not going to do it. Keep it simple. Yep. Okay. Not coming when called. Yep. Again, off. It's always they're off doing something else that's much more fun and more rewarding. Sniffing, playing. Uh, the behavior is they don't come to you when you're you know calling them repeatedly, 
And the consequence is there's more play, there's more sniffing, there's more fun. Hey, this is kind of fun. You are chasing me now. This is great. How do we solve it? Um, you have to be more rewarding again, so you have to be more entertaining. Don't call repeatedly. Go and get your dog and don't, don't cuss them out. <laughs> because it's only going to make it harder for you. Although you're totally embarrassed and you have to go over there and get them. Um, you're going to practice the reach, reward, and release. Um, even when you're not working on come. Okay, so you're in, just at home. You're in your kitchen. You just go over and they've got their collar on and you just reach. Grab the collar. Hold on to the collar. Give a treat and let them go. Okay, that's it. So when this does occur like if you ever need to go your dog is playing but you need to go get your dog don't ever call your dog to you by the way if they're playing because you're just calling them away from something that's fun um, so it's negative and so you need to go get your dog you just reach you know and you're able to clip them it doesn't become an aversive thing like the fun's going to end by doing that it all so by doing so without putting them actually on a leash where you're just grabbing the <laughs> collar treating and releasing they're never going to instinctively think that the fun is going to end so that they are going to come to you without this game of, okay, I came to you, but now I'm going to run away when you reach for me and go back to the fun. Start off in small steps. Don't go too fast. That's okay. And uh, like I said, never call your dog to do something negative, not even a nail trim. Like even myself, sometimes I have to catch myself saying, okay, it's time for your bath. Don't say that. <laughs> if they don't like it, don't say that. Okay. All right. So this is the beginning. So Dana's doing an exercise. Was this Reese or Brandy? Oh, I can't tell. Um, and again, start off small. She's only going to take a step away, and she's got her on the leash. And she, just, she has her in the corner because it's just easy for her to focus. And so go ahead and play that. Yep. Charlie's watching. She's learning. OK. So she's just going to ask her to. There we go. Good. And then she calls her over. So she only took a couple of steps. She did not make it too hard. She didn't expect that she was going to stay there for very long. So again, she did not work on two of the Ds at the same time. So she didn't ask for more duration and by adding distance. So she just added distance and said, OK, come to me right away. Yeah. <laughs> That's OK. All right. So then she adds criteria. She adds a few more steps. And then she brings her back to that same location because she's trying to keep it simple. So if she worked all around the room right now, the dog might start to get a little bit too confused. Yep, if they get up, just ask them to sit again. And I'm asking her to wait. I'm not asking her to mm -hmm. stay. So there's a difference between wait and stay. <laughs> Charlie wants to come. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good. Okay. So work at the dog's pace. So if she was having trouble with five feet away, go back to two. See how she does there. Build up upon that. We have, you know, sometimes we have, we have another student in class and she, can't, she couldn't get to 10 feet. She had to always go back to, you know, like one foot or two foot, you know. But the thing was she kept on trying, attempting that 10 feet over and over again, was, which was only frustrating her and frustrating the dog versus going back to the simple and then building up, okay, let's just go for two and a half feet now. Let's go for three. And she was able to build that by saying, hey, slow down, slow down. I know you want to get to the goal, but let's get there, you know, slowly and surely. Okay, running recalls. So use a long line, especially since you're going to be taking this outdoors. So get them used to that line um, because you want to be able to have some control. You can also use someone else to hold them back, and this induces drive. So. Um, you know, the other person would be sort of just holding, not physically impeding them, but just holding them back on the chest, holding the leash, and then you would be um, enticing them to come to you, running away. As they're coming to you, you click, right? And then you continue running and give the reward. All right, so we're trying to get the drive to come to us. So by holding them back, there's that resistance. They want to get to you. They want, again, the opposition reflex. They want to get to you. Okay. Can you just show that one more time? Because it's pretty quick. Okay. So I ask her, wait. I start running. Again, I'm not graceful. Okay. 
wiggle Okay. The other thing you can do, if you don't have somebody else that you can practice with to hold back, is you can use like this column. You take the long line and you wrap it around there, right, halfway. So you got a halfway, the dog is here. And you do the same thing. So you keep the tension and then you say, you know, Reese, come. And you start going, release the line, click as they're coming to you. And when they get to you, you take a few more steps out and give them the treat. So you can do that outside too, if you have a fence, chain link fence, anything like that, out the outdoor air. So you don't have to have somebody else that you have to practice with. Okay. So if you're outside and your dog's off leash and you want to come to you, when you're using the clicker, you click when they start coming, you keep clicking and then they get there? Yeah, yeah. So, so yes, eventually, yes, you, you don't keep clicking. You click once when they're en route to you. Okay. Um, but you don't want to take that outside and off leash until you have... 100% confidence again. This time, probably, yeah, a $100 bill. <laughs> Bet me that they're going to come back to you. <laughs> you have to have that confidence. So if the exercise was that they were running towards you, but you wanted them to sit once You can add that. You, do I click for the sit or do I click? Just click for the coming to you, ask for the sit. Yes, okay. good job. You know, they know sit. By this time, you're, you wouldn't be working on recalls until after sit is like really firmly in their brain and they know that. So then, then just say yes and go ahead and give the reward as they get to you. Yeah. Sorry. What to do when Yeah. So you gotta go. You've gotta go back in training. So it's way too distracting. Like wherever you are, whatever you're doing is way too hard for your dog. You've gotta go back to these first methods: working indoors, getting a good, reliable recall to you, running recalls, practicing um, the recalls with the long line outside is critical to be in the next step. Like you don't want to just take them outside, leave them off leash, ask them to come, 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 come. You kind of ruin the word. You're going to have to rename it. You know, we joke like, yeah, we're going to call it pickle. We're going to call it this. We're going to call it that. You know, rename the word. If you've overused it and your dog doesn't come to you, come up with something else. Yeah. But if you can go and actually get your dog, yeah. then go ahead. But if they're going to start to run away and think it's a game. Run away. Run away. Get excited. Yeah. Come on, let's go. You know, yeah. go get this. Yeah. Especially if you go backwards, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Or I've seen people too where they just fell to the ground and flailed and pretended they were having way more fun than the dog was having with yeah. whatever they were doing and the dog came over licking and jumping on them so they got them back, you know. Yeah. The other thing too is you can create an emergency recall which would be strictly for emergency. You would not want to use it unless you absolutely had to and you would just have a special word for that and they get the biggest jackpot for coming to you. And you start off with just the same things, like the small steps, you know, for a little bit away. And they get huge jackpots with that command. So if, you know, if my emergency recall was pickle, you know, that I was gonna say at the dog park that I need the dog to come to me, I would jackpot him for that. And then I would only use that in an emergency or every now and then to get him away. Cause I really want him to have that, boom, I'm running right back to you, you know, permanently. Yeah. When you said yeah. If they're playing, you don't want to interrupt it. Uh, they if they're playing, you don't want to ask them to come, right? Because you're you're ending something that is rewarding for them, and they're gonna sort of you know say, uh -huh, I don't know about that. This is much better, and you're gonna end the play. Every you know, go and get your dog, make it a good thing, and treat them. So what I would do to build that up is I would just walk during play. I would walk over, do the reach, reward, release, right, and let them go. And then do that again during play. Reach, reward, release, and let them go. So it doesn't mean every time you go and get them that the play is going to end. It just means, hey, I'm just checking in with you. Here you go. All right. Go ahead. Go play. So the emergency recall would be used if there was a fight. Yeah. If a yeah. fight started or they were going to run out into a busy street. Yeah. Or they were going to yeah. knock a kid over. Yeah. So, you know, they were just it's so excited to see this, you know, a toddler mm -hmm. coming towards them. But, you know. For a parent or the toddler, that's going to be a scary thing, even though the dog just wants to lick yep. the ice cream off his face. Yep. You know, so that would be the emergency recall that you would want to use. Okay, I promise we're almost done. I know yep. everybody's probably getting a little bit antsy. Uh, this um, is distance. Yeah, so this is a distance recall, but this is indoors, so this is downstairs in our facility. So she asks for the weight. This is a student, by the way. 
She turned her back and everything, was able to walk away. And Gunner was a rescue, an older rescue that had uh, no impulse control at the beginning. Yeah, and he was mouthy. He would put his mouth on your arm and everywhere and um, just, yeah, had no self-control yeah. whatsoever. And yeah. he actually passed the uh, CGC. CGC. Yeah. 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 What is CGC? Oh, the Canine Good Citizens Test. Has anybody heard through the um, AKC, through the American Kennel Club? So it's sort of like a, a, a good citizen criteria of, you know, I'm, I'm a nice dog. I greet people well. I greet other dogs well. Um, a lot of insurance companies now mm -hmm. are requiring the powerful breeds to have their canine good mm -hmm. citizens, the German Shepherds, yep. the Rottweilers, the Pitbulls, the Dobermans, um, just for insurance purposes, just to say, yeah, my dog has been trained and I can keep them under control. Yeah. Do you get reactive dogs to the point where they can pass that test? <sighs> um, who do we have? Um, if they're not fearful, like you just, oh, you know, you um, have to sort of pick and choose. There have been some dogs that could have passed, but they didn't necessarily want, you know, they yeah. didn't want to take the test. It depends on what kind of, what you want to put your, you know, how, mu how much work do you want to put in to be able to pass the CGC? If you have, let's say, a fearful dog, um, do you want to put them in that situation where, you know, you're sort of enticing yeah. fear? Like this guy, uh, Guam, here in the picture that we're going to show, um, could pass the CGC, but he has a bite history, so he can't. Mm -hmm. But now he's at a point where he certainly um, he could have passed. He could have passed. Yeah. He could yeah. Have passed. Yeah. So through yeah. all the work that his owners did, coming to class and working with him and all these different things, he's a he's a fantastic dog. But because yeah. he has a past aggression history, yeah. you can't test him. He's boarded at my house. Yeah. He's come and stayed yeah. with me, and he climbs up on the couch and he you know gives me kisses and you know like. Six months ago, there's no way I would have allowed him to even stay in my house, let alone yeah. give me kisses on my face. So, um, yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is a d distance recall with the long line. With you a see lot the of distractions, line. you can see that all we're the cars out, going you know, by. We're in a parking lot. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Excitement himself. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this is again Gronk, and I think yep. I forget who. I forget which dog I held up to tell you when he when we show the video. Come on, start. So yeah, this is a bocce court. Uh, I think no. Galani. Is this Galani? Uh, Where is no, this? No, this is Ward? Um, Ward Park in okay. Marlboro. So yeah, so they had them both staying all the way at the other end, no yeah. line. Yeah, we put them there. We walked away, and they came. You know, and they didn't go to play with each other either halfway through they just yeah. they came to us. so we would work yeah. on those distract distractions in class like putting things out putting food down put a big fat bone down see right. if they would come to us right. and not divert over to go to those objects right and there's a soccer game going on uh, you can't see but there's a kids yeah. soccer game going on there as well yeah. okay okay well yeah come join us if you like you know it's a lot of fun um, you can get help on your specific areas. So the classes are great. It's levels. It's almost like a gym membership. So these guys know from Bay Path too that um, you basically you pay like a monthly fee and you come to as many classes at your level or below as you like. So for instance, there's like level one classes four or five times a week. You can come to all five classes if you want to come. Um, or you can, you know, if you when you graduate to level two, then you can come to level two or level one classes. And same thing when you get to level three, which is the top level, you can come to any class. So you have, you know, like, you know, 12 to 15 classes a week that you could possibly attend right. if you wanted is, to. Why would I want to go to a lower class if my dog is already improving and can do, can work at a level mm -hmm. three? Well, you get those dogs that are that can't work on the distraction in the level one yep. that become a distraction for your dog and it becomes more you know, you get to work on those high distraction. We're in a, we're in a small room, there's puppies, they're barking, they're, you know, they're not mm -hmm. so, you know, as disciplined as a level three, and you get to work your dog in that high distraction. Yeah. Uh, it's great, you know, just more, it makes it more and more difficult for your dog, is, really, is what yep. it does. So. Yep. But, so, um, and then, you know, we offer private training programs too, if it's just the group classes, is not something for you. Um, you know, and there's different modifications. We train, you know, first of all, we train your dog. We could do that. Um, we train you. Now we could train you to train your dog. So there's different variations to what can be done. So. Do you have any therapy dog classes ever? We don't, but CGC is the first test for therapy. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah. Do you have um, in your group classes? Can children come with the adults? Is there an age limit? They can. So if they're under, I think it's if they're under nine years old, another adult has to come so they can physically be sure to, that someone's watching them. But if they're ten, they could go by themselves with the dog. With you, with oh, you, oh, oh, a separate can. like whoever's handling the dog can't be watching uh -huh. the you know young adults. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Next one. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, the only thing to do is you know. Once you get into training, that kind of thing, just decide what you know, set yourself a goal and say what you're going to do first. When you you know can enjoy your dog in new and improved ways, and you can come talk to us about getting started. And um, you know, as an added benefit, we do discount for Bay Path for private and training and uh, group classes as well. Yeah. So anybody have any other questions? We just finished on time. Sorry, <laughs> 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 a lot. <laughs> 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 <laughs>